I'm Rachel Wild. I'm the head of Global Implementation Enablement at Harry. My guest today is Rachel Wild, who is a leader with over 20 years of experience specializing in SaaS adoption and growth for startups with a deep understanding of SaaS technology and customer experience. She has worked at various early and late stage startups, including Healthy Pets, acquired by VCA and Tech, Ozzy, Next to Friends, and currently as Head of Global Implementation Enablement at Harry, an end-to-end talent acquisition and workforce management platform for the hospitality industry. At Harry, Rachel works closely with product managers to scale technology onboarding for new clients leveraging her business acumen and technology expertise to drive the company's success in the highly competitive SaaS industry. In this episode, we talked about how to ensure successful onboarding and customer success, the product team needs to understand and prioritize user needs, of course, but also consider compliance needs, user efficiency, and scalability. We discuss how Harry leverages the latest technology to onboard its customers and how Rachel works with a product team to establish onboarding processes that are predictable, scalable, and provide a consistent experience. Welcome to Product Perspectives, the podcast for product people that gives a voice to their stakeholders, hosted by Magali Pellissier. Each weekly episode shows you the other side of the product with interviews of the people who contribute to making products a success. They are engineers, writers, marketers, support analysts, UX designers, or even salespeople. Not only will they get the credit they deserve, but they will share their perspectives on what makes a good product and product manager. Stakeholder management is a key skill for product managers, so just as you're obsessed with listening to your customers, let's hear from your stakeholders. Thank you so much, Rachel, for joining me today. I'm very excited to talk about your role. And the first thing you told me when we talked the first time, but also just now before the beginning of the interview is, you know, this enablement title that I've got, it's a bit confusing. So I'd like to understand a bit more about your background and how you became head of implementation and customer enablement at Harry. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to join today. So let me give you a little bit about my background. So I have worked in different businesses for over 20 years in the B2B sector to B2C. I have specialized in technology and different types of adoption as well as operations. When I came to Harry, I came back with this. I have commitment to service and customers. And so I joined the customer success team. But like many startups, that was very, very small. And as we grew, it became clear that Harry itself is a workforce management platform. And the challenges we faced was that how do we onboard our customers once they're in our system, they want to use and adopt it, that created challenges. But we had quite a bit of challenges in implementing our customers. And so what I did is originally we split off and I started to head implementations for North America and led a small team to onboard our customers. As we grew, our global teams combined, and we have now, you know, in North America as well as UK and EMEA. As so what happened was we realized that there was a lot of challenges. So I developed a team. So I no longer work on the day-to-day implementations. I work with the team implementing, and we look at strategies of how do we project manage? How do we standardize and create a better customer experience? as well as how do we actually enable our software and gather data for our clients. So my role is really taking the high level perspective, but also going into the details to basically assure that we can deliver for our customers the client experience they want in the time they want and how to, how to, can we speed up and basically improve that experience for our customers as well as make it uh, easier for our own staff to, to deliver a really good quality product. Right. And I like that point. It's very important because we're always so customer focused, customer obsessed. We think, how can we make it better for customers? But it needs to be easy for people internally. Otherwise, it's too much admin, too many things to think about and things don't go smoothly. So what's the part you enjoy the most about this role? My role has changed over time as and as many startups go, it changes. 
So I would say that when I first started, it really was solving customer problems and, and looking at the customer on day to day and how do we make it work. Now I really focus on team development and how our team can deliver. Uh, what is really, really been enjoyable is we have built these amazing team members. We have developed programs. Last year we had a program called Project Harrier because we are, the company is Harry where we had 40 groups collaborate and really got to talk to each individual and contribute to how to make our processes better. How can we deliver more for our customers? How can we create toolkits to make it easier for them? And this contribution was amazing uh, development. We've talked change management and such. But what I really, really enjoyed was the team really uh, worked together. They, I, they developed leadership skills. They crossed departments. They crossed globally. And watching these people develop and grow and really exceed anything that I started back four years ago is the most amazing thing. And that's what I enjoy most. It's really my team. To- Great. That's very exciting. And can you give me some context about maybe the size of the team and the number of products, the number of customers, so we get a, an idea of the complexity? That's a great question. So we'll start with the product. So Harry has two main platforms, the talent acquisition and workforce management platform. That simply said is everything you want to do, hiring, onboarding of new employees, as well as then our workforce management is scheduling time and attendance and communications. And we focus on hourly workers in the hospitality. We, we obviously have salary too, but if you think about that frontline worker that we've been talking about for the last couple of years, the challenges that they have to make it easy to schedule, to be fair in the U.S., to, to meet global necessities, that's what we focus on. So it is really important to get it right because it really is something that affects everyone on a micro level as a macro. So we do want to have the business succeed, but we want to have each employee get paid correctly, get their jobs, find great talent, go place work. So it's really important that we do a really good job. The impact is so great. Now, team-wise, we have over 45 members, about half and half in the U.S. and U.K. We specialize in general onboarding, as well as integration setup. We have a lot of technical as well as data migration in this process. We have to understand a lot of jurisdictions. So we have quite a few teams. We include a small but growing L&D team, which is about eight people, I think, right now. And then that is our general who use client facing. But in the back, we have over 300 developers who we work with who are uh, making this amazing product. And to the point, Focus on the clients one on one and what their their needs are for our product, but overall we want to scale to the clients. So we focus also on how do we deliver better. And I think that's the thing that when you first start off, you don't look at in, in the micro. You you're thinking how can I help the customer? And in the end, helping the customer is making it easier to deliver to make the administrative for them less, make that process less painful because ultimately no one has time in these days we all want to be efficient we want to we just want to know it and have it now and so that's that's kind of a little bit what we focus on as of today right thank you it really gives an idea of 45 people working on this so can you walk me through the onboarding process then what mm-hmm. role do you and your team play in that process when a client is onboarded at harry what we first do is we gather quite a bit of data about how they operate, where they operate, what type of locations. We generally work with a lot of restaurants and hotels, so we need to understand a little bit more about them. So we do a data gathering as well as discovery sessions with our, our clients. We also make sure we understand what systems we're going to integrate with. Our team then follows a standard project management to, in the sense that we're going to, after discovery, we're going to design the, the product for them. Then we will walk through the execution. So we do a lot of UAT and working sessions to make sure that the client is getting and understands what the product is going to do so they can also plan how that changes their internal SOPs. And then we'll go through and launch through the product, and that's going to touch everyone. So as one is looking at scheduling, that means you have to have, like, a dishwasher understand what's going on, as well as, like, the VP of finance. So we, we work with all levels. My team focuses on how to make sure that the product delivery is, that we ensure that those implementation teams and deployment are really setting up the product, understand that we also are releasing and growing our product constantly. 
So we're making sure that we're understanding how and then giving processes advice on how the product is going to work and the types of solutions and best practices for individual cases. We also then look at what is causing, you know, bottlenecks or slowdowns or a lot of work within our teams and working with our product team to then either improve the product. And this year, we're also focusing on outside tools that we can complement because, as we all know, our product teams are asked to do an amazing amount of work and with little time and, you know, it's always easy. So we've actually created a strategy this year to look at focusing on what the product team and really delivering what they can work on and then working on some tools that we can use in the the meantime. So we're not pushing all of our burden onto a team and expecting them to create miracles. So that's the the big focus of this year. I like the first stage in the process, which you said it's discovery, it's learning. And I think that's really what product managers do when they join a company, when they meet client or customer for the first time, they really are tuned into listening and trying to understand what's going on before trying to help and act. Absolutely. It's one of the biggest things that we've noticed is a client comes to you and is going to say, I need X. And you need to peel back that layers. What are they really trying to achieve? Especially when they come from a different product, they really often try to solve the same way the old product does. And they left the old product for a reason. And so it's really stepping back and being able to ask the harder questions or deep in dive and say, what are you really looking to do? What is the needs that you want? What would be your ideal? And being able to start to really peel back that. And that's going to be extremely helpful for your product team. The more discovery and the more conversations so that you understand your client, you're going to build a better product. And you're going to, whether it's configuration or actually new product features, it's going to be much better for that client. Right. And that's such a good point that sometimes customers are stuck in, this is how the older system works, or this is how we did it before. This is my spreadsheet, and (laughs) I did everything in my spreadsheet. And it's really hard for them sometimes to think, okay, well, what is the the exact problem? And there's a new way to think about it and a new type of solution. So you seem to be gathering a lot of feedback during that phase and also to understand a lot about the customers. So that's something I, I deeply care about as a product manager. So how do you work with product managers to ensure that the onboarding is integrated in the product design and the development process? Well, how we work with product managers is we really want to get to and start with that user story. And so I think this is where discovery overlaps very easy. If I understand the business case and I understand the value, and we're also going to think about it from a business perspective, our client will want everything they want. What we have to say is, is this something that is a shared problem? And that's why we really started the enablement is because we could see across multiple. I mean, we we onboarded, what, over a 1,000 clients, uh, God, almost 2,000 last year. We're onboarding quite a bit more this year. So we see this in this macro perspective. We see these reiterations. So we know where the big pain points are. And when you're in the mix, it's very hard to see. So that's one of the reasons, like, we have this enablement. So you think of a sales enablement. It's really saying we need to hear what our client's saying. And when you do onboarding, you're getting into the details. Because if you don't miss, if you don't set it up correctly, it's going to miss. Now, how do we work with the product managers? Is if The better we have our user story, our business case, what is the real need? We work even with our legal team to understand what does that mean in contextually because we are in a compliance state. So even if a client sometimes will ask us things, we will we will back off and say we do not believe that's compliant. Um, And so we have to be a little bit of a safeguard because customization isn't always the way to go. And that's a big, hard one that's that a lot of customers don't want to hear is that just because you can customize, just because we could do it doesn't mean you should. And it, it comes back to you have to weigh what is it for compliance? What is it for the use case of the business? You also have to realize that the end user needs to be efficient. And a lot of times that's where a misstep we've seen is that a client wants something very complicated, but we understand that day to day user would not be able to execute that. So it's not a good value. So we have to weigh this. And with our product managers, we want to make sure that our back systems are working with it, that we can deliver it and set the right expectation. 
And so it's really about having open conversations, giving them the right tools and giving, and listening to them and saying, what is possible? What can be done in the short term? And might not be from a business perspective, what we would want to do. Yeah. And I should clarify for the audience that you're not working on off the shelf product. You implementing software that's way more technical and that requires a lot of building, which is why there's a lot of, of work to do with the clients. It's not as easy as just, here you go, turn it on, and it just works. It, and I, I think that's a big, that's a great point, because there are a lot of systems which you come out, and it's really about configuration. And our system has some elements that we almost want our clients to feel that way. I feel like if we have done our job, the client should not feel like it is technically challenged to put together and it's very complicated. What they should feel is it's very off the shelf, but that's an illusion. And I know that a lot of software is kind of, I always think falls into these two camps is that one that is pretty much, you know, you can sign up online, it's going to jump on there and we're now working on adoption. Ours is more complicated because of the space we're in. So we are configuring it and it is technical and we do have integrations as well as how does this go? And then because we do, you know, multi-jurisdictions, uh, it, also means that we're really diving into each level to the local and making sure that we're setting them up for success. Right, which leads me to my next question, which is how do you balance the need for that customization and personalization during the onboarding with the need for scalability and efficiency? Because you onboarded 200 customers last year, so you can't do customization every single time. It's it is one of the balances is, and this is where we started was you really, this is what I would advise. If you have a complicated process, what you start noticing is that there is what I call the 80 90 rule. 80 or 90% of it, most customers will, will set up in a certain way. And so you start off with a base model. And what you want to do is be able to identify in that base model very key changes that you need to be able to do and ask upfront. So our discovery is often very pointed. We know we're going to ask leading questions because they're going to be indicators that they're going to be off standard. And because of this, we have a client solution because remember, post onboarding, we move to customer success and support. And if everything is very, very different per client, the support is going to be very lacking. And a client experience is over time. So we want to have something, the base model, and then we can talk about variations off of it. So our support team and our success team are really set up to understand the business need, but we're all speaking the same language. So how do we balance that and with our products? So we obviously have large enterprise clients which get prioritizations on exactly what they need. We have one that's rolling out that's 22,000 locations. There are some prioritizations that are going to be specific to them. But for the most part, we're really trying to gather for our product team what we're hearing overall. We also have our team that looks at adoption and every part of the life cycle. And then we have these different stakeholders who are coming and showing our view, but having those discussions early on and sh- and sharing those kind of different aspects gives our product team more of a 360. And I think that's where it's key. I will have a perspective of all the issues we see when we come on and what our clients are constantly saying. But we also know that two months later, once they've gotten into the product and they're really using it, they often change those priorities. And so we want to make sure that we understand and prioritize. We really understand what are the blockers as well as understand what their wishes and then really talk about what really needs to be. So we do a lot of in our project management, very strict. We have a head of that we've hired last year, year and a half ago, who's really brought into really good change orders and project management and SOPs. And she has done an amazing job of making sure we record it all the way. And that our clients feel they, they're heard, they understand business, and we get back to them. So it's really being very much collaborative, but also being very good at that documentation and, and being very transparent with your client. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Great. Okay, so that's very interesting because in product management, onboarding is a very hot topic in regards to product-led growth, which is when the users can self-serve it and they almost don't need any help. And in your model, it's the opposite. They need a lot of support. So the metrics to measure success would be different. So what are those metrics that you use to say, yes, the onboarding process has been successful? And how do you use those metrics to improve your process over time? That's a great question. And it's actually a hot topic for us. So we 
developed some general project management and we do have, sorry, we do obviously look for customer satisfaction as well as MPS because of a product. We also t- look at how much workload and, you know, is the project on time and delivery rate. So we look at cycle time. So that's what we've been focusing on in the last few years. We are now also adding a whole layer because we really identified that we were delivering good product. We were doing an amazing job of getting our customers set up, but we started noticing that our adoption rates weren't always what we would hope for. And I'm sure that many people in SaaS know that that is truly, if you want stickiness, referable clients, you know, you want to make this integral to their day-to-day lives. And so we are, part of our project carrier was actually looking at why is this happening and what can we do to facilitate it? And what we identified was after COVID, I'm sure it was true beforehand, but COVID, I think, exasperated it, is teams are much more lean and efficient. They're, they're asked to be very, very efficient. They don't have often a change management team or an adoption team in this. So we've started to create success metrics and working with our clients to understand, like, what other keys? So talking about are we taking trainings? Are people doing the activities we want? So we, we also know that adoption and learning happens over time. Right after onboarding, we expect certain key success metrics. We look at, are they doing like the basic functions of our, our roles? We can measure it from a user perspective. We can measure it from a location perspective. But are we hitting that first mile marker? So on go live, we're now starting to look at how did we get there? And so we've developed more change management toolkits for our, our, our clients to help them get to the first metric, because then we want further adoption and learning and basically really getting the ROI out of the client, the, the product. So metrics are starting to change because we're really starting to look at not just did we succeed and deliver a product, but we don't think success is just there. We think it's once we really look at the client experience and we look at every end user's experience and are we meeting that? And we're staging that into different levels. So we start off with the basics that we would set, expect on launch, and then we're starting to let that grow. And so that the customer success team now knows some focus areas, what they did well, and what areas they can refocus. Our, our learning and development team is then can create modules and such to make it easier for them. Again, we're sit, focusing on that, and then they can go through and say, now we've got best practices and we've gotten further adoption, and we've obviously got tools to watch how our teams do it. And you're talking it out about partnering with other teams, whether it's customer success, product management, but what about the sales team? Because they sign a deal and everybody's happy, but then you need to have a smooth transition from sales to onboarding. So how do you do that? When we were growing as a startup, we all know sales teams need to sign a deal. And so perhaps they embellish or they promise things that are beyond what is really doable. (laughs) What we look at is we actually went back to the sales team last year. That was another initiative we did. And they're, they're really doing much more discovery and talking about what the client needs. They're also tracking what the requests are and making better business decisions. And again, I think this is now we're at a stage where we can make those decisions. When you are starting out, you kind of have to get your, your your big brands and you're going to make compromises. And that is normal. And I think that's one of the things is you have to realize that every time you join a company or you're working a company, understand what stage you're at because you do need to grow that company in peace. But on the other side, we do now have better SOWs. We work about how and, and, and form our customers up front. We're constantly learning and adding and developing it based on like what we see here. So we work very closely both with sales and solutions. Uh, today we have our go to market that we started last year that included implementations and product and solutions. So we're basically trying to again, I think the biggest thing we've said is we have to make sure that everyone understands a little bit about what our teams are facing so we can deliver this. There's nothing worse than client expectations being set, coming into implementations or working with our product team and really feeling like that wasn't was going to be delivered. And so the, we want to smoother, even if it is taking time and being honest. We found our customers, if you're transparent, are amazing to work with. People understand, you know, that things change. Last two years was, you know, was big. We have a lot of new economic challenges this quarter. Our our own businesses are telling us different things. They're saying, our, what I told you two years ago isn't true anymore. So 
So being here listening, we also have a lot of ways to develop or catch it. But I think that's a great point because it can feel like sometimes sales and product and, you know, customer success are at odds. We really strive to really make this seamless and to really, you know, everyone kept in mind in our world is it is about the customer and it we can't fight it. We want to deliver for the customer and we all want to go above and beyond for that. And I think that has that has developed over time and is, is definitely improving um, every day. And you made a good point about the world is moving, things are changing. So how do you make sure that onboarding is a continuous process rather than just a one-time event? So that's a great thing. So onboarding for us is when we look at it, once we develop a product out, there is our, we have another great group. We have our support team, but we have our customer success team. And so our customer success team is, is getting involved in any new releases and we talk through it. They're part of the stakeholder because they're going to continue to pull this into the customer and develop it. Our L and D team is integral to that because even if we add new features and such, so we're, we're constantly updating them. I think one of the challenges we've had was we released in so fast. Our customers actually said, you know, it's go, it's too much for us. Internally, it was a lot, but now we're looking at how to release out and basically feel like and work with our larger customers, especially who might have process changes, so that they feel that they're handed through it. They have a key person that's going to work through with this process with them and answer questions and also look at their business needs because that's a big part of it is, yes, onboarding is the initial stage. We will we also, as you upsell or you get new product lines, we definitely have a couple of, you know, big ones that we've launched that are really good premium features of our platform. They'll come back to implementation just because of if there's needed for discovery, but really they get someone in customer success. And I think that's the other shift you see happens in a client. If you have a software that's like an easy platform, customer success usually acts as the onboarder. When you have a more complicated, you do see these different teams. And it's really how we can talk to each other as well as our support team to make sure that we have a unified area. And then we're all also on with all the stakeholder meetings and the platform as well as product with the product teams and talking through it. We obviously have leads or client initiatives for the beta program, and that's a bigger, bigger thing, but it's making sure that each side has it. So we see some new technologies coming up. How do you think they will change the way you onboard customers and you enable them? What are some emerging trends that you think I, as a product manager, should be paying attention to. This is so opportune because this is actually our big initiative for 2023. So in 2022, we did look at standards and how the product team would develop and help us scale. And what really came out is we couldn't, and it was not best business for it to rely. So we also spent a lot of time last year looking at the different emerging technologies. You have AI, ML, which we have already incorporated in some of our platforms. But from an onboarding perspective, we wanted to say, like, what other technologies were out there? So now you look at not very new, but RPAs, EPMs. One of the things that we also are very conscious of is data security. So workforce management is a lot of sensitive, sensitive data. And so what we did is we partnering with our, like, CTO and such and saying, how can we transform, you know, make sure that when we collect data or we onboard someone, there is a migration process and decided it wasn't necessarily the product's responsibility for the migration. So we're going to be using tools such as RPAs, BPMs, and other emerging technologies to help our clients make it easier to provide data, to make it more seamless so that our our product can basically migrate in a healthy way, the data, but also, uh, you know, create these processes that will help us do these customizations and make it more assured that what we are doing, because it, it is quite complicated, can be also filled with error, make it more regulatory. So they understand that we're partnering with them so that we are basically taking one portion of it and using new system tools to assure all of that. But we'll be working with the product team. And then that means that we often now look at scalability and using it with a RPA or BPM integration or through an API, and instead of just asking them, can you make this easier? So it's really saying we're going to take a partnership level with that team, and they can tell us this is what we can do, and this is what a product viable for this year, and we can say here's what we're going to use to, to meet our customers, 
And how do those two systems meet? So it's it's a very exciting time to for us. Great. And I've got a question from Amanda Habash, who is product lead on this talent development and internal tools. And she's got 10 years of experience in product management. So let's hear her question. Hi, Rachel. So my question is, how would we know as a product team what's the most important thing for us to get right? In other words, we have the priorities set right according to the stakeholders who might not be aligned between themselves. Given that, we try to provide enough training and coaching for the features and enhancements we have in the pipeline. Thank you. So, Amanda, we have, because of our platforms, we have multiple product owners. And we also have, you know, multiple systems. And one of the big things, initiatives, were to get more involved, the stakeholders last year, into talking with product. But Amanda brings a great question. And I think uh, it actually, she brings up really good points of what is the responsibility if you're a stakeholder and how you work with product. And one of the big pieces is, again, everyone has, as a stakeholder, their view, their tunnel that they're looking at, the lens that they're looking through. And what you have done from your lens is, one, early stages of stakeholders, I think it's understanding your customer and understanding the business need. We're really taking the time to first say, hey, what is this solving? Why are we doing this? What is the importance to this team? And then in my stakeholder lens, what's extremely important to me? What are my requirements? And the first piece is to understand what your requirement is and not mixing that up with what you wish it would do. And, you know, that minimal viable product, you know, that MVP, what for your team or what for your customers at this stage is absolutely necessary. And the mistake a lot of people make is they, mix up what is required with what they would like. And you really, we always have our dreams. We think, oh, I'd love this to do this. I think it's really been editing it back and saying, this is the requirement pieces. This is what we need. And then when you go in to share the pieces, you need to listen to other other components. But you also need a champion. So that's where you have your business, your product owner. Because ultimately, business has to say, what is more important than others? So you may not be number one and you need to accept some of that because ultimately, like when I launch a software, I have different personas and not everyone is going to feel like it is the best for them. And that is part of change. So one of the things I would talk about is really understanding and stating it, really taking the time to, listen, and as it comes out, to really, really understand the impact and understand how this affects your team. And then giving feedback on that and not just responding to it as, you know, it's not what I want. And that's key. So and then our teams, if we've done that due diligence, if we've understood from stakeholders and we have all of that together, the business owner has it. When we launch those features, they they will be explained why this was done. The good news is, especially groups like us, we most of our teams are working in agile. We also can say that what was backlogged. And that, I think, is a really good thing is we have to be through that project launch. There are going to be decisions if something's going to be backlogged and really being able to say, yes, this is OK. This is still the minimum. And if you do not know and you're in a stakeholder and you can't understand it, get the teams and ask and make sure you're contributing in a meaningful way. And that's, I think, one of the responsibilities when you work with your product team is to be you don't have to have all the answers, but you need to be able to represent your team or represent the, your customer be able to go back to them and find out what is actually minimal and not just say it all has to be done. Right. And I think that's one of the themes you want to explore in the question you've got for me as well. Yes. In your experience working as a product manager, have you found business stakeholders tend to prioritize functionalities or over scalability when developing products? If so, what steps do you take to educate stakeholders on the importance of scalability in delivering successful products? Yes is the answer and i have to say this is a tough question (laughs) you're actually challenging me well let me tell you that you've just mentioned it mvp that minimum viable product there is a bias in how we interpret that and sometimes we just want to build something quickly and we'll think about scalability later i would say it's fine and it's fine for startups too because the goal is really to validate the product market fit and that's fine I remember talking to UX designer in one of my earlier episodes of Product Perspectives and was saying, well, actually, 
definition of minimum viable product sometimes is not aligned between stakeholders. So we should first do that. And the definition for UX designer may actually include a lot more of these aspects of scalability. If I talk to salespeople and to your team, for example, you'll have a different definition of what MVP is. So I think having that first discussion. And it's especially right with some stakeholders, I can think of more customer-facing roles. They have a view sometimes that a good onboarding is something very customized, very personal, having that personal touch. And every customer is so different. It is my role as a PM to show the commonalities and to work with all stakeholders to highlight the impact that this amount of customization has in the medium and the long term. And potentially that can be highlighting the extra work that's going to be needed as a result or highlighting how it slows us down. Actually, there's also one recent episode I did with Jessonda about customer education program, which I think you, you really like because it's, it's in the same area as you. And one of the takeaways was that having a customer education program and all that onboarding, it is a key differentiator. It is an advantage in the market. So we have to think about them early on. And even though I don't want to be the process person because that's not my role and nobody really likes to be the process person, everybody should own the process and, and contribute to that. So as a product manager, talking to people, building those relationships, those partnerships that you talked about, being aligned and explaining the why. And it starts from the product. It starts from how do we make onboarding scalable in the product and then it will translate into the processes as well. That's great. And I, I think you brought up some great points there because it is not a, what is minimum viral product is going to be different. And then what is it really necessary? And again, I think stage is really important to state here because you are going to sacrifice to deliver. And one of the things we know is that the sacrifice is going to be what's going to not face the client because that's, the, that's going to be the most important because we need to get it out. And then at some stage, the technical depth is going through it. I think also the kind of component we ask for the product is there's going to be, you talked about processes. I think of it as an approach that once we start understanding how we're going to scale, it's really about we have a systematic approach so that we can kind of be predictable. Be, and that's a big thing we've noticed is that we're, we were changing a little bit of like, how do we think about it? Because we really want to say, like, what is the requirements on the back end? And it really came to a front once we started getting into huge volume. So it always was could be Band-Aid. And it was our our groups were like 20, 30, 100 stores. 200 was OK. Once we started getting into the massive numbers, it really showed the weakness of it. And what our clients want, expect is that it's absolutely standard. And so that really came back around and said, we need to be able to make it predictable. Yes, you brought a very good point about consistency and the fact that the onboarding has to feel consistent for the customer, whatever product they decide to buy from your company. So if you have especially lots of product because you have a platform and there's different components, it's very important to have that consistency for a good customer experience. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you for your question. I'd like to move to the final part of the interview, which is fire questions. I'm going to make several propositions to you. You pick one of them and you can elaborate if you want to. Okay. First one, small business or enterprise? Small. I, I, I love startups. I love when we're changing and we're developing because I'm by definition, I like only to work on pro problems. So I love startups because you just get to your hands and everywhere. Um, I've worked at enterprise companies like GE and T-Mobile. I will do a startup any day. Five people, I don't care. I love it. Strategy or execution? Strategy. It's very important to think big and say, how. I love to figure out where we're going to go. So, again, I think that goes to back why I like startups. In person or remote? Depends. In person is great for teams. Remote often is good just for because we are need to be efficient and uh, to be able to see each other. I do love that we have web because this has made a difference. It was just phone calls and emails. I think then it would have to be in person, but technology is making it easier to connect. Book or podcast? Book. Manhattan or booking? Manhattan. Enough. It's always going to be Manhattan. Now, 
I will say I'm in Harlem. I you know, and I love I've lived most of my time in New York City. I've lived in uh, what they call upstate New York City, which is above 125th. And I absolutely love it. I left during COVID and I came back because I, I love living up here. Right. So to wrap up, what advice would you give to product managers who are looking to improve their onboarding process and the customer enablement efforts? Work with your onboarding team to understand the customer journey. You are going to be able to, at different stages, accentuate the scale, you know, really help scale. But in the end, we all know that we're all here to gain customers, to give satisfaction. So really understanding what those needs are and then really saying, where is the bottlenecks with the client, with onboarding clients? And identify and prioritize those first. So sure. if people enjoyed this conversation, how can they contact you? Well, you can contact me on LinkedIn. My uh, LinkedIn is rwild first, or you can get Rachel Wild. I am currently working at Harry. I love to connect. I'm also in many groups. Uh, I'm very passionate about, you know, startups and such. So please feel free to connect to me. I would love to hear your thoughts. And I'm always growing. So I'd love to tell, challenge me on anything I've said and tell me how I could do it better because I love discussion like that. Brilliant. You have certainly challenged my thinking, challenged me with your question. And I've learned so much in this interview. So thank you so much for taking part in Product Effective. Well, thank you so much. I think this is such a great series. And I, I really, once I started really understanding what you did, I think this is amazing because we often don't talk about it and we, and we don't know how to work together. And I'm very happy and you've done a great job of bringing this kind of topics and discussion forward. So thank you so very much. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. If you have suggestions for topics and guests or any feedback, you can write to Magali Pellissier at hotmail.fr.